The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the start of the 2020 NAEP conference. Uh, I'm Ian Tant. Uh, I'm the immediate past president of the Royal Town Planning Institute and it's my delight to join you for the conference uh, for this, my third consecutive year. Um, this, of course, is a very different year. Um, instead of about 100 or 150 of us uh, gathering together somewhere in the middle of England for a day, we have a week of online events, uh, and we are joined up with the Wales Enforcement Conference. We're involving speakers from across the UK. Uh, registered attendance suggests that we'll have many more NAEP and RTPI members joining the conference this year than in previous years. And whilst we'll miss the camaraderie of coming together and networking, it certainly tells us something about how we can operate differently uh, in the future uh, and in this new climate, and how we can contribute to the RTPI's target of achieving carbon neutrality by 2025. This won't mean holding future events entirely online, but it does suggest that more could be done both to host online events between the main conference and to allow conference attendance via IT as well as in person. As I've said, this is my third consecutive NAEP conference, uh, and I'm looking forward to this as much as I have the previous two. Uh, last year, I commented on the work of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, and the identification of enforcement as vital to achieving high quality design outcomes. Uh, the Commission continued this theme in its final report at the end of last year, and I'm pleased to see that the government has picked up on this. There are many aspects of planning covered in the English White Paper, Planning for the Future, and the RTPI will be responding to the consultation of this before the deadline of the 29th of October. It has consulted far and wide with members in compiling its response. Whatever the challenges that the reform proposals bring to many aspects of planning work in England, it's great to know the repeated reference to the role of enforcement, including the pledge to strengthen enforcement powers and sanctions, and the intention that local planning authorities should be able to reassign resources and focus more fully on enforcement. Indeed, there's a section of the white paper entitled Stronger Enforcement. So let's make no mistake, enforcement is an essential part of the planning system, and it seems that the government has recognised its importance and the need to strengthen its powers. So I wish you a great conference as we look forward to a strengthened service in all our councils. And now I'm delighted to introduce to you the chair of NAEP, Neil Whitaker, who is going to make some opening remarks. Over to you, Neil. Right, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and as chairman of NAEP, I would like to welcome you all to the beginning of uh, RTPI Enforcement Week. Uh, given the challenges that we are currently all facing, the decision not to hold the NAEP annual conference has been made for us but it's given us a great opportunity to join forces with the team behind the annual Wales Enforcement Conference and bring you 12 sessions throughout the week ahead covering a broad range of interesting enforcement topics, which we would not ordinarily be able to cover in a single day conference. Being able to take advantage of this virtual conference platform has enabled us to invite contributions from across the UK. We will have case study sessions, for example, looking at the lessons that can be learned from England, Wales and Scotland on the importance of getting the enforcement notice right and examples of how enforcement is being used to deliver positive outcomes. We will be covering historic buildings enforcement, the use of drones, prosecutions and injunctions and even a session on philosophy, which I have to say I'm particularly looking forward to. We also have a number of discussion sessions on a variety of topics, including advertisement enforcement, which is this afternoon session at two o'clock, which will feature panelists from England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. All of our sessions this week will have well over 100 attendees, with some sessions having over 200. And I would like to thank everyone who has signed up. 
Attendees of each session this week will have the opportunity to contribute and get involved and ask questions of our panellists. And you can do this by clicking on the questions tab on your screen and typing in your comment or question so that the chair of that session can pick these up and relay them to the panellists. All of the sessions this week are being recorded and will be available to view on the RTPI's YouTube channel. Links to each session will be available on the NAEP page of the RTPI website. NAEP currently has over a thousand members from across the UK and we hope to continue to build on all the ex excellent work previous NAEP committee members have undertaken to ensure planning enforcement continues to be viewed as an essential part of the planning system. Earlier this year, NAEP in association with MHCLG published its updated enforcement handbook, which is available to everyone for free on the RTPI website. And I would encourage everyone to download a copy of this if you have not already done so. As Ian mentioned just now, it is an interesting time for enforcement with the government publishing the planning for the future white paper, seemingly steering local authorities to focus more on enforcement going forward. I've spoken to a number of NAEP members about their responses to the white paper and have heard some very interesting ideas and suggestions on how enforcement powers might be strengthened, which leads us nicely onto the final session of the week where we will look ahead to the future of enforcement. So before I hand back to Ian, I would just like to say thank you all for signing up today and I hope you enjoy the week's sessions and find it useful. Back to you, Ian. Thank you, Neil. Um, so, on to the, uh, the meat of this morning's opening session, which is looking at the power of enforcement. And we have two speakers uh, for you this morning, Adam Shepherd and Tony Trotter. Uh, I will introduce each in turn uh, as we come to their presentation. Um, but uh, I would remind each of them that you have about 15 minutes to speak. And I, I will remind you when we're getting towards the end of the 15 minutes, so we can uh, keep some time for question and answers. Um, for those of you listening in on the, the webcam viewing in, uh, you will see uh, the questions function, hopefully on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and I enc encourage you to type in your questions uh, as Adam and Tony are speaking. I'll pick those questions up with them and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can uh, before the end of the session which is due to finish in about 50 minutes time. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll, I'll turn to Adam. Uh, if Neil and Tony can turn their cameras off uh, at this point. <clears throat> uh, Adam is uh, an associate head of department and lecturer in urban planning at the University of West England, Bristol. Um, Adam joined the university 10 years ago after working in planning practice uh, as a development control case officer for authorities in Essex, South Gloucestershire, South Gloucestershire and Herefordshire. Uh, and he now teaches and researches development management related matters, development management related matters. He works with students studying planning, property development and architecture. Um, Adam is going to give a presentation which focuses on the continuing challenges concerning the delivery of an effective planning enforcement function uh, with the emphasis upon the need for planning to adopt a genuinely integrated end-to-end -end approach to the process. So uh, over to you, Adam. Thanks very much, Ian. So over the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is, is talk very generally about what you might call a, a state of the nation of enforcement, but trying to be mindful of, of where we are now and where we're potentially moving forward. I don't think this is a new conversation in many ways. I think we're at quite an important moment across all of the nations of, of the UK. There's been conversations specific to enforcement across all four nations um, in the last couple of years. And now, of course, very much front and center in, in England as a result of the white paper. But I think this is a series of conversations that we've been having over quite an extended period of time now. And one of the things I want to touch on in, in this presentation is how I think personally at the heart of the issue are some long standing challenges that, in all honesty, I, I personally still don't feel we're necessarily 
putting in the center of the conversation to the extent that that we should and and i think that the presentation that's going to follow my own as well as over the course of this week actually that is what we're going to do and i think that's really important um for me i've been working in around uh, planning enforcement as a, as a teaching academic uh, since I moved across to UE about 10 years ago. Before that, I was a, a development management officer, so I'm working with rather than in enforcement. But over the course of the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in a series of projects, the fourth one, um, which is still ongoing, and it's picked up some, some constant trends, which is also something I'd like to touch on in, in this presentation. I think the first point to stress in, in any event like this when we're reflecting on enforcement is just how critical and central within planning enforcement is. And I don't think that's something that, that needs necessarily to said to this audience, but I think perhaps there's a communication challenge for the wider audiences of all stakeholders uh, that interact with or work with planning is to the role and, and positioning of enforcement. And I think it's important to, to make the point that enforcement is a part of planning. It's not a, a, a separate space to planning, which sort of provides a backbone to it, but in a separate way. It's an integrated element within planning. You know, planning, ex planning exists in, in many shapes and forms, and enforcement sits within this space of planning to ensure that other aspects of planning are effective. And it's this integrated approach and integrated way of perceiving and operationalizing planning that I think is important. I think it's interesting when you look back over some of the, the key pieces of work that have been done relating to planning enforcement over the last decade, that it, it's, it's not regressive the way enforcement's spoken about, it's aspirational within this wide space of planning. A Stitch in Time, which I'll come back to, talks about planning enforcement being a key activity in ensuring straight spatial visioning are not undermined. So enforcement being a part of the wider aspirations of place management, not a small space of regulation, but a grand space of enabling the visions that we all have within planning. And I think it's also important to recognize that throughout history, actually, the importance of planning has been recognized from the perspective of, of the enforcement piece. Right back from before the 47 Act, actually, we can, we can go back hundreds of years to see embryonic forms of planning enforcement existing. And certainly in 1947, there was a recognition at that point, the critical role of planning enforcement. And I think I think that recognition has always been there, but not necessarily across all audiences. And I think that's that's an important part of, of how I think we need to move forward in this positive space of enforcement. So th this is a mixture of, of what I think are some key steps that have happened, but also some less significant perhaps, but pieces of personal work that I've I've been involved in. I think certainly over the last 20 years we've been having some really critical conversations about enforcement that that go beyond a recognition of the importance of enforcement and also recognizing the lack of, of opportunity that exists within enforcement in some respects because of because of its positioning particularly with regards um, resourcing I would suggest which is something I'll, I'll come back to but a series of pieces of work um, in 2006 2008 that emphasizes not just the importance of planning enforcement, but in parallel with that, the importance of a credible and resourced space. And I think that remains at the heart of the discussion. It's how much resource is available and critically, how this resource is going to be going to be used, how, whatever size it is, which I, I know Tony's gonna to come on to talk about importantly in the next session. Um, I've done a few pieces of work myself that, that have continued that narrative, something with um, Scott Brittle in 2013 that, that talked about the importance of, of bringing enforcement within the mainstream conversation about planning. It feels too much like a bolt-on in too many instances. It needs, to be, it needs to be within core discussion in more instances, I would suggest. We've seen around the UK various publications and pieces of research that have, that have come up with I would suggest quite parallel and corresponding key points. And even in some of the smaller scale work that you can see there, the same points are coming up. The narrative, I would suggest, remains 
relatively unchanged across this 20 odd year period that we're talking about where i think we've, we've been having a rolling conversation with with moments of significance rather than this being necessarily an entirely new conversation that we're having in the last year or so what has been picked up across all of the projects that i've been involved in and all of the other projects we've seen around the the, the, the nations in terms of research into planning enforcement are a series of continuing challenges where some progress has been made in some instances but those narratives continue one is societal knowledge and understanding i i am of the view that there is a fundamental lack of understanding with regards what enforcement is how it sits within planning and what what it's for and i i go beyond the idea that enforcement is a part of the planning space there is, I think, and this came up again uh, last year or so in some work I did for the BBC, there's, there's a view that enforcement is there to punish and to make happen what was in that original plan. The idea that enforcement is a discretionary space, that enforcement is a place of professional decision-making, of judgment, that enforcement is a space of delivering those aspirations for place, that it's not simply a space of punishment and ensuring conformity. I think there's a really important piece of work there that I still am not seeing picked up to the, the extent that I feel it should be. Um, another area I think is, is compliance monitoring. Every piece of work I've been involved in has flagged the importance of compliance and monitoring, but also the inability of local authorities to do it or to sustain it because of resourcing challenges. I think that's partly down to structural challenges, both within local authorities, thinking about how um, the constructs of authorities exist, um, but it's also about approach and compartmentalization, often out of necessity, overriding all this being uh, a drive to deliver in a very constrained resource environment. The limitations of resources impacting upon the ability to undertake compliance and monitoring, impacting upon structural approaches. When I talk about approach and compartmentalization, I, I, what, what I'm going to come on to talk about that I think is important is, is how planning operationalizes itself. And at the moment, my impression and the impression I get from talking to, to planning professionals through the research that I do is that planning activities remain too compartmentalized. The idea of the planning application being the beating heart of all that we do. And then other things happen afterwards. And I think the integration of the other things happening afterward into a mindset that sees the management of sites, not the management of processes, is important. And planning's not alone in this, but if we look at other areas, other industries, and the idea of the process of development, the idea to the delivery to the management of the site, in some areas it's done differently, and they're not focused upon element, process, and system, they're focused upon the site and the journey of the site. And I, I think we can do more and better around that idea of site management and the journey of a site within which processes take place. And I still think there's a piece of work to be done there in terms of how we approach these things. There has been comment throughout about tools and about the levels of, of fines and the significance of those. And it's an area where we have seen change. Um, it's certainly not a new discussion. The very, very first thing that I did as a baby planner at Braintree District Council many years ago when I had hair and everything was um, to be involved in, a, in an enforcement case where the removal of a protected tree enabled a site within a settlement boundary to come forward for development. And the fine was quite modest, but it opened up a site for development. And right then, from that moment onwards, this narrative of, of the balance of, of enforcement activities, and within that, the space of fines, um, that was quite an, an important part of, of how I've seen and looked at planning. But the thing that has dominated everything I've been involved in is resources. How resources are used that exist and the availability overall of resources. And I think that will continue to be a conversation. And, and I think we can approach this from two angles. The first is, is how we look at securing additional resource. But I think a really critical conversation, and again, I know Tony's gonna to talk to this, is how we use the resources that we have to best effect.
I think the opportunities that exist are within the approach and I put togetherness on there but it sounds trite I know but I, I think it's really important to to reflect very much not on the individual processes and the individual tools alone but also to think about how all those pieces of the jigsaw come together and over the course of this week there's some fantastic examples of how individual activities and, and combined activities come together for impact and I think how we think more widely about that togetherness is important and I think that's about how local authorities come together to share best practice to share approaches maybe even share resources is a, an important conversation and I've engaged with NAEP for many years now and I know the, the good work that they do to bring authorities together in having those conversations I think it's also about how enforcement interacts with stakeholders um, outside of planning and I would go as far as to include people like the media the political space as well how we interact in these different environments and how we ensure that part of that actually is education education as to what enforcement is trying to achieve in the things that it undertakes I think within authorities there's a a moment of reflection perhaps about how enforcement is resourced how enforcement is structured and within services i think this this idea of site management rather than process management is is really critical i think to me picking up on the most recent piece of work that i've been involved in which was a, a west of england combined authority piece of research looking at the post consent space and someone that we spoke to in that interview said when they dealt with the application and it's gone they let out a sigh of relief they breathe again because it's done and then at some point it's going to come back and there'll be various matters relating to conditions nmas enforcement and so on and um but that that's for another day i th think that's a completely understandable mindset and i can relate to it on a personal level as well but i think that's partly the challenge i think it's how we go beyond that to look at how sites are managed mindful of communication project management it's not necessarily about having the same person involved, it's how the narrative is retained, how the intent is maintained, how the key aspirations, objectives of a site are maintained from beginning to end. I think that's a really critical space for emphasis. I think the elephant in the room in all this remains resources. And I think we have to be mindful of the fact that resources are not going to suddenly come forward that are going to allow us to do all the things that we probably want to do within the enforcement and planning space so i think it is about having parallel conversations what can we do with additional resource as it comes forward but also critically how can we make the resources that we have now work to best effect there's lots of ongoing conversations about this around the, the home nations in the last couple of years every, every area of of the uk seeing conversations around planning and enforcement has been a part of that conversation which is which is great and in england because it's it's happening now of course we've got the suggestion that will be insights into um, the potential for new powers, new resources, and so on. I think what's interesting about the research that I've, I've been involved in is the quest for more power, the quest for more tools, hasn't been a dominant narrative. There's not been a strong voice to say, I need more powers to enable me to do my job. It's typically more been about the ability to do the job within the constraints that, that people are working within organizationally from a resource perspective from a stakeholder relationship perspective but nevertheless um, the idea of more powers more resourcing etc um, potentially to be welcomed of course i think there are things we need to be very mindful of um, this isn't a space for, for a critique of, of the white paper we all we all have our, our views on it and I certainly wouldn't want to suggest I, I know more than the people that, that put this this piece of work together but I think it's important that we have some some key conversations the suggestion that the changes in the white paper concerning England are going to free up time that, that's certainly not my interpretation I think the, the work requirements being placed upon us may change I would suggest it won't mean that there's less work involved for any of us and there's a few sentences here and there like the one there relating to the environment agency that i think raise questions in terms of quite what is in store for us as a planning group so finally i think yes 
tools, funding, fines, any opportunity around there, no doubt to be welcomed. But I think for me, it's really about how we approach change, how we manage change, how we manage place and enforcement's positioning within that. You know, we go right back to the earliest piece of legislation that has planning in it. And we see the aspirations of planning. We see the intentions for planning as a space, this bringing together of a previous hodgepodge of, of regulations into, into a, the idea that we need a holistic, combined, comprehensive space for the management of the built and natural environment, this idea of planning. And enforcement is in there and it has the same aspirations ultimately. And I think it's thinking about how individual sites and wider places are managed that we should be really thinking about. Um, over the course of the week, there's some, there's some fabulous presentation I can see coming up. And I think looking at the individual elements is brilliant. I think how we bring them together needs to be a real focus for attention. Thanks very much. Any immediate questions that you want to follow up outside of this, then, then do drop me an email. Um, otherwise, look forward to the rest of the week. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adam. And uh, yes, it uh, comes back to that uh, a challenge of resources. It's interesting to know that the RTPI uh, in submitting sending reviews uh, has suggested that we need something like a billion pounds of, of money invested into planning if we're to fulfil all the things that are, are being requested. Um, so I've no doubt we'll come back to the Bureau of Resources in the, uh, in the Q&A session. So th thank you very much indeed. Okay, so it's now time for me to introduce uh, Tony Trotter. Uh, Tony started off as a planning assistant in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in 1989. Uh, he became a senior planner and enforcement officer. Uh, he's worked in enforcement uh, since leaving Kensington and Chelsea at Canterbury City Council. Uh, at Argyle and Butte Council, uh, and now at Glasgow City Council, where he is the principal planner and planning enforcement team leader at Glasgow City Council. Uh, Tony is going to speak to us about essentially moving enforcement uh, from the issue of powers uh, and fines to concentrate on what I think he refers to as more deserving cases. It is again uh, an issue, I think, of focusing resources. So, Tony, over to you. Thanks for that. Uh, good morning, everybody. In thinking about powerful enforcement, uh, we tend to think about the powers available to encourage, force, or ultimately punish people if they fail to comply. The Scottish Government's emphasis on increased powers in the Planning Scotland Act 2019 was mainly to increase levels of fines for breaching effective enforcement notices somewhat ignoring the fact that so few councils can persuade a procurator fiscal who carries the prosecution in Scotland to take the, court, the case to court in the first place. Ultimately, however, this is the direction of travel for the type of breach involving persons who often have little or no regard for legitimate civil authority, never mind planning rules and regulations. Therefore, strength in enforcement in my mind, and I know Adam has, has talked about this because it is all about resources, it lies in prioritisation to show speed, resolve and resilience to deal with cases where action is most deserving. The Council's requirement uh, to prepare an updated charter came through the 2006 Planning Etc Act. We have that requirement uh, through that legislation to provide an updated version every two years. This is the foundation stone for outlining the Council's position regarding enforcement, i.e. enforcement policies, procedures and powers. And through published, published service standards, it is the stakeholders user manual of what to expect from the service. The service standard one in our charter, Glasgow City Council, is to acknowledge a case within five working days. The service standard two is to undertake an investigation and visit the site within 20 working days of an um, acknowledgement date. And that is happening at the moment, taking into account our, our current COVID-19 site visit protocol. 
Uh, service standard three is to visit high priority cases uh, the same day or the next day, and that involves any kind of felling of trees uh, to a TPO to, or in a conservation area. Works to uh, listed buildings and through the lockdown uh, situations where there was uh, not just those kind of scenarios, but also potential threat to life or limb. The service standard four is at the, the heart of my discussion today, and that's uh, the PIR. To provide a PIR within two months, and a PIR is a planning impact report. Now, in effect, this is a report of handling, and it's the same kind of way that a planning application uh, would be dealt with. Um, it's an assessment of the breach, and it takes into account uh, more than a planning application would uh, the general permitted development order and permitted development rights in relation to that any relevant council policy and other material considerations. Uh, but then it goes on further to talk about the expediency of uh, any required action. Now, you can see around the clock here, there's five categories of planning impact report. Uh, category A is where enforcement actions required. Now, the assessment has uh, resulted in a conclusion that there would be no point in inviting a, a retrospective application. Why waste everybody's time? We're clear on the fact that there is a demonstrable harm, and that's the direction of travel in which we're going. Category B is to request a planning application. That's because there seem to be material impacts that's deserving of a, plan, a further planning application. And that'll take on board any uh, neighbour comments through uh, notification there. Category C is a minor breach of planning control. Now, this is really what we are kind of trying to kind of remove from the system. You know, we have to, and it requires a detailed assessment sometimes to say what the impact is. This is perhaps one of the most con uh, contentious of the categories. You know, we have rules in terms of general permitted development order rights. And people see those as absolute, but sometimes if it's just a, a small amount, then we have to, to take a view in terms of whether it's expedient to pursue or not. Category D is where there's no breach. That's because it may not be development or it's permitted develop, development. And category E is a suspension of the provision of a concluded planning impact report. And there might be extenuating circumstances uh, why that applies. I'll go into more detail on that later on. So in terms of the detail on the categories of planning impact reports, talked about category A being the most exciting one for the complainant, if you like, that enforcement action is necessary. Development causes significant planning harm and requires a formal action. And it will necessitate the service of an enforcement notice, obviously, after a reasonable period of negotiation and the guidance in Scotland. I'm sure it replicates guidance down in England and Wales. Is that, you know, uh, there has to be no, no unreasonable delay in getting to that stage. Now, this, this situation is not a development as such, but it's a, a dilapidated uh, property in the centre of Glasgow, which is a nightclub. And in this situation, we served a section 179 notice, which uh, I think the equivalent reference down in England and Wales, if I can remember correctly, is a section 215. Now, uh, amenity notice considerations apply to planning impact reports as well, as do um, any kind of breach of the advertisement regulations. And in this situation, we served a 179 notice. Unfortunately, we got compliance and everything was all white in the end. Category B is a requirement for the submission of a planning application. Now, again, we wouldn't normally uh, request this in a situation where we thought we were going to go straight to enforcement action, certainly. You know, so the, within the assess, assessment, there is a detailed consideration of this, and it's as much of a deemed assessment as we can possibly provide. 
given the information at the time. But that leads us to the conclusion that uh, there's a reasonable chance, if not more than 75% chance that planning permission will be granted. But obviously certain considerations come out later on through neighbour notification, et cetera, and you know, perhaps impacts from other uh, areas that we never uh, quite uh, perceived at, at the outset. So as I said, it allows for those full for a full consideration of those implications, and it might be a situation where we can mitigate um, any of the worst impacts of the development by the application of conditions. But also quite usefully, and I'm not actually a hundred percent sure on this if it's something that's available down south. It was something that was brought through the 2006 Planning etc. Scotland Act, and that was the ability to serve what's called a Section 33A notice. Now that requires through legislation uh, the submission of a planning application, but use, usefully from our point of view, it stops the clock in terms of any uh, potential for immunity being reached. Four years, obviously, in the case of operational development and 10 years for a change of use. In this situation, we have a, a, a fairly modest side extension, although it's within a metre of the boundary and over a certain height, that, that means it requires planning permission. But with the application of uh, the, uh, some proper conditions to do with materials or cladding uh, to match the main building, it would be entirely acceptable. And similarly, an outbuilding, which, you know, as, as it looks, is uh, quite substantial, but, you know, it's not really impacting hugely on surrounding properties in terms of sunlight or daylight. Category C is a minor uh, technical breach. Now, I think we find probably that these constitute uh, the main component of the complaints that we receive. Um, you know, it tends to kind of relate to minor breaches of uh, the general permitted development order, and technically there might be a requirement for consent. And as I said before, people would say, why have the rules in the first place if you're, if you're going to let them be exceeded? But I think there is a, a, ne a necessity to say the point of which planning permission is required. Is it in the public interest to pursue? This goes back to Adam's talk about uh, resources and as a practitioner of many years, um, I think it's essential really that we, we cut to the heart of what uh, is meaningful in terms of enforcement. So we have to make these stark choices sometimes in terms of what is expedient and what isn't expedient to pursue, but to demonstrate through detailed analysis which is the planning impact report, that there isn't a public interest. But, you know, as with any property search, if anybody's trying to sell the property, there will be the potential for an enforcement case to be identified within that. So there will be a record to say that there was a minor technical breach. And I suppose at some stage there may be a contact by a potential buyer who, or a buyer solicitor, who seeks confirmation that the council had decided that it wasn't expedient to pursue. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of situations relate to fences. You know, it's incredible how many of those type of breaches, minor kind of things like that, can come into play with this. It's 1.04 at the front of a property, which technically is a breach, but as you can see, it doesn't really have any negative impact. The same, <clears throat> excuse me, the same applies to this fence over two metres at the back, which actually, I would say, is, is beneficial in, in terms of offering a bit of uh, privacy between uh, the two parties. In category D is where there's no breach of planning control, and that's, again, probably looking at it from the point of view, is it development? And in saying that, we do get a lot of... Uh, complaints directed to us that should be directed to the different departments. So we'll provide that advice in terms of any kind of uh, proper place that it should be directed to. And if no further action uh, can be taken, the case will be closed. But again, probably what the majority of those situations would be where 
uh, its permittive element. And I would only say with this one, it is actually quite amazing what you can do with permitted development rights. Uh, quite substantial looking outbuildings there, you know, and it doesn't, and they don't need planning permission unless perhaps <laughs> they've been used for Airbnb. Short term lets, as is a major headache for Glasgow, I know, and Edinburgh in Scotland in particular. Category E is a suspension of the investigation. Now, this is uh, what I said before, where there might be extenuating circumstances whereby, um, you know, there might be ongoing discussions on a major development site and there might be discharging of conditions that are taking place with the planner and the developer. And so we kind of step aside and give a reasonable delay on it before we consider in conjunction with the planning officer if there's a need for further action. And that after the Category E, there will be a return to consideration of whether Category A, B, C, D are required. So, in conclusion, what do planning impact reports provide for us? Well, improved communication with stakeholders. This was one of the main reasons planning impact reports were devised in the first place. We focus minds at an early stage and form a contractual commitment to future action. Transparency of the decision making process is crucial um, and that can be further down the line when, the, when challenges are made to our decision. I mean, some decisions in the past perhaps hid to some degree behind what I would call the expediency factor. And consequently, those decisions were being challenged at all levels, you know, with the officer themselves. Sometimes there'd be several emails going, going back and forth. And through the complaints, sorry, through then to me, the line manager, and then maybe my line manager. And then after that, if there wasn't satisfaction uh, with the results, then it would be directed to the, the council's complaints handling process, which is a, another two stage process. And once that's exhausted, then it would be uh, possibly a case that it was uh, reverted to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman up in Scotland. So all of that takes a huge amount of time. And, you know, that evidently is a reduction of an escalation of complaints if we can provide a solid answer at the outset, at the early stage. Increased certainty for all concerned is important, particularly at that, that early stage. I mean, it is important to say clearly why action will uh, be taken and why action will not be taken. It puts everybody's minds at ease. And again, we'll try to kind of marry it in with the, 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 the planning applications situation. So it's an assessment within that time frame, which is two months. And all in all, this gives us, it reduces, takes cases out of the system and gives us a fantastic opportunity to spend more time on deserving cases, uh, meaningful actions, which are worthwhile, through trimming the excess weight off our flabby caseloads. We have great, greater resource and therefore power to deal with the harmful breaches, which we have to deal with. And Thereby, we have an opportunity to remote, report more cases to the procurator fiscal and therefore raise the profile of the planning enforcement service. And that's all for now, folks. Any questions? Tony, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it, it really is one of the delights of the enforcement conference uh, that we are actually able to get into the, you know, to the extent the nuts and bolts of how the service is actually being delivered. And uh, your uh, presentation has provoked the first question that we, we've received in. Uh, perhaps if I can ask Adam to switch his camera on and, and join with us as well. Um, this question from Mark Lane, uh, and his question is, uh, do the panel think that we need to change the level of the statutory function of the enforcement role from just an investigatory one to one that has to, has to make a formal decision 
whether a breach has taken place and what appropriate action is required. Uh, and he adds, because he's obviously quite struck by the idea, that this is to integrate the function in the minds of development uh, management, uh, planners and other stakeholders. So uh, I, I think, Tony, if you'd you like to start on that, because obviously what I think he's reflecting is, is the sort of approach you're taking with your PIRs of formally uh, coming to a decision rather than just simply investigating and perhaps taking an informal decision about whether it's expedient to take action. Yeah, well, with the planning impact report, it is obviously a, a requirement of the charter um, for us to do that, and that's to provide within a target of 80% of situations, and that that will increase as uh, we kind of move on, you know, to provide 80% within two months. Now, how we could actually formalise that within a, a, a statutory situation might be um, quite tricky. Um, would we be able to, to actually require people to, to provide an assessment of that on a, a, a statutory level? I, I just don't think that would actually be a possibility. So I think it actually, it sits, I think it sits better with uh, the service provision in terms of saying this is, as I said before, this is the planning enforcement chart. So this is how things are laid out. And this is the, the, the service standards that we provide, which is, so therefore it's your user, user manual to how you engage with the, the planning enforcement service. I think, I think that's a level beyond saying that, you know, there's some kind of formal process by which it would be similar to a planning application. I'm not quite sure how we could apply that. Okay. Thanks. I mean, Adam, uh, do you think that's something that we could build into the review of the planning system here in England, not necessarily in terms of the, you know, the target date or times by which the report should be done, but whether we should actually build in the requirement to actually have a published formal report? Yeah. Um, hi, Mark. Um, I, I think it's a really good point. I, I think the technicalities of, of how it would be operationalized would would need a lot of thought and conversation, but I think I think it's an important point. And in in some of the work that I've done, I've been really struck by the direct impact of the statutory positioning of enforcement upon authority behaviour, actually, including uh, how resources are prioritised based on where statutory functions are considered to sit, and they're given priority resourcing. And I've certainly found in the work that I've done um, a view that the statutory positioning of enforcement to investigate only, only um, limits their positioning in terms of the hierarchy of prioritization. And I think it does come back to how enforcement is seen within planning and how the activities of enforcement are seen within the wider space of planning. And I think that we can get them into the same space, um, the better. And I think these sorts of considerations are important, not just to the practice of enforcement activity, but also the perceptions of enforcement and the implications upon how local authorities prioritise prioritise resourcing. I think it's a really important part of the conversation. Whether that's whether that, quite what it would look like is is another matter, but I think it's something that we should definitely be having a conversation about. Okay, no, that, 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 that's that's really really helpful. I mean, this this issue about the the purpose of enforcement. It's obviously something which is right at the forefront of thinking i think now uh, you know, certainly in england with the current white paper um i'm struck by your use of the the word aspirationally uh, in relation to uh, enforcement uh, and what i am struck by is that the the agenda that the government seems to have um gets slightly clouded because it does get into powers and, and fines and things like that but the basis of the aspiration is one of achieving higher design quality uh, and and the intention it seems to me as i read it is that uh, as enforcement officers we should have a greater role in uh, making sure that the designs that come with planning permissions and the conditions that are applied to those are then enforced now I'm, I might be wrong, but it seems to me that's a whole other level of work uh, above and beyond what uh, what Tony's been describing in the work that he does day to day. 
I, I think continues to be too much focus on the need for tools and fines. And I think there needs to be far more attention on how we do what we do to best effect. Um, what the research that I've done, the need for more power and resources hasn't been at the forefront. It's about the inability of teams to be proactive, to undertake compliance and monitoring, their position within authorities, and also understanding of the service. That The work that I did for the BBC, I was really struck by the extent to which the media and the public that I was talking to considered that enforcement was there to punish and was there to ensure that the original permission was delivered. And I actually think there's a bit of work for, uh, for us all to think about how we're perceived and that actually enforcement is a discretionary space of planning judgment. And I, I don't think that's properly understood. And I think still now, when you look at the white paper and you look at what's happening elsewhere in all of the nations of the UK, there's still a focus on more power, more tools, more fines, and actually not about the operationalization of planning and where enforcement sits with that. Yeah, uh, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, applying fines is unlikely to improve the quality of, of building outcome. Um, you know, the intention is actually to ensure that you get the quality that was promised. Uh, and, and it doesn't strike me that fines would be an answer to that. I don't know what your, your view would be on that. I, I agree completely, and I think that the work that I'm doing at the moment on where the, the, with regards to the post-consent space, the key message was about maintaining the narrative. So when we move from the application into the post-consent space, whether that's NMAs or conditions, Section 73s or enforcement, it's about how you maintain the narrative of the site. What are the design aspirations? What are our intentions for that site? And how can enforcement and any other space of decision making ensure that that narrative is maintained and not lost and i think that should be the focus yeah just just to add to that you know in scotland we have had again since the 2006 planning etc scotland act an ability to serve fixed penalty notices in relation to non-compliance with effective enforcement notices and that was elaborated on in terms of listed building enforcement notices with a an increased scale of a uh, fine when but you would have to you know you would set with the listed building situation you would have to serve a fine and that would be a certain amount a thousand pounds or two thousand i can't remember exactly right off the top of my head but then you would have to serve another enforcement notice to get to the increased level of fine so overall you know we we did embrace it at the beginning and and did everything we could possibly to do with any kind of non-compliance with effective enforcement notices. And it did give us an, an alternative to, to not being able to go to the fiscal because trying to persuade a fiscal who's caught up in all sorts of crazy, wonderful cases, you only have to watch Taggart to get a flavour of that. Um, but in a so little uh, court time available that you can understand why there isn't the possibility to have that arena to to try to punish and you know punishing is the extreme end of the process but it would be good to be able to do it to say or to go to publicity and say this is what happens this is an example of what can uh, be resulted in if you don't comply and there's plenty of opportunities further down the line to comply but going back to the fixed penalty notice you know it was it was never going to be a success in relation to the fact that it could, the fine could never be carried as a land charge. And the Scottish Government's lo uh, logic at the time was that it didn't want to interfere with, with, uh, with individual property rights. So what's going on here, you know, you've got individual property rights who are affected by a breach that's ongoing. And quite often, you know, with effective enforcement notices, all we can say is, well, it's, it's, it's a blight in the land, but that's really just in terms of any kind of right-minded person saying in the future i'm not going to buy a property that's got an enforcement notice on it so it really needs to be something a bit fun fundamentally more uh, uh creative and ambitious you know i would suggest some kind of environmental court is required but it takes away the prosecution from the mainstream other types of uh you know breaches of all sorts of civil um legislation, etc. I, I think as well, Tony, one, one of the points you made there about how
planning is is seen and presented in the media. Um, I think I, I think this wide piece all needs taking into account, and certainly one of the pieces of work I did, a local authority spoke very, very strongly about the power of political support and about how both having the media and the political space on site has a very powerful impact upon how enforcement sits within a local authority and how things like dealing with untidy land, um, the impact of, of fines and taking action, actually it can present the local authority and indeed perhaps the, the, the politicians involved in a good light and it, it generates a positivity about something that can otherwise be seen as quite a negative regulatory space, um, a punishing space. And I think it, it's seeing the role of fines in the positive sense and the way that that can, pres that can position enforcement within planning and indeed within a local authority. Okay. It, it rather takes us into, we, we, we've had two further uh, questions in. Uh, one is actually a comment from Vicky Bowles who uh, comments that uh, as a case officer with a constant load of almost 200 cases, um, she would worry that a formal report would slow the process down. Uh, I think that, that at least is an example of the sort of issue about the need for resources. Um, but the, the, the further points coming from Daniel Galpin uh, is an interesting one, which is it just reflects on what you've just been saying about the, the political public interface of, of enforcement. Uh, and the question is, how important is the role of public education in the enforcement process? He says, for example, could better public engagement reduce the amount of complaints about development that is not actually a breach of planning? And on the converse, would more serious planning breaches be identified more quickly? Um, Adam first, then, then Tony. Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, I, I think there's, there is a whole piece around how not just enforcement, but all of planning is perceived by society. And I think enforcement is particularly challenged in that regard. And I think there is a need for a better presentation and communication of what we do in enforcement and how enforcement is this positive discretionary space to realise the ambitions of a local authority. And I think a lot of the, the challenges that we have in terms of how enforcement is presented in the media and how people approach us with a, with a preconceived idea of what enforcement is, I think that immediately places us in a position of, of challenge that, that isn't that doesn't need to be there. I think it's something we can be proactive in to address. Okay, so, Tony, any thoughts? Yeah. The only thing I can think of really in terms of this coming into to play with, with us and, uh, the, you know, it has been the case, I think, over the years that we have tried to kind of put in information to leaflet um, properties and conservation areas regarding changes to uh, windows, which seem to be the the kind of you know the, the things happen seem to happen in waves. There's certain types of uh, breaches at certain times, and going back to my early days, I think it was satellite dishes uh, and the kind of rash of them that caused problems, and particularly in conservation areas. And then later on, it was uh, UPVC windows. So from time to time, we have had kind of leaflet leafleting campaigns, but the problem is that it's a resource factor. And, uh, you know, very much um, money for anything is ring-fenced very tightly by councils and, and doesn't enable us to, to, to draw on, you know, being practical and proactive to prevent things from happening. Uh, I think really, from that point of view, really probably we have to get down to a community level and we are trying to, to engage more with uh, the community organisations that tend to to complain about things, you know, for, for, you know, another wave of complaints was about HMOs in the past because there's a need for planning permission for those as well as uh, for a licensing scheme in, in Glasgow. And we have had success in relation to kind of engaging with uh, people on specific subjects, but it's, you know, leaflets go in the bin and council's websites are all well and good for directing people to, but you can't force, you can lead a horse to water, etc. But I think it's engagement at uh, a community level that can produce results, and I can't really see much um, more than that in terms of improvement. 
Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, we've got time for one last question. We are actually right on the uh, the, the end of the session now. Um, but Mark Tansley asked a direct question of you, Adam, which is, did your work with the BBC also find that elected members see enforcement as a punish first operation? Hello, Mark. Um, yes, um, it, it did. I, I was really taken, actually, it, it, was, it was relating to a series of cases around, around the Bristol area. Um, where there'd been variations post post consent that were being regularised, and one of the things that seemed to to particularly tax both the media and and those involved, including including the politicians, was the idea of expediency, and actually the fact that enforcement is this discretionary space, and I, I think that's at the heart of the lack of understanding. I, I, th I think people understandably see how other spaces of regulation and um, enforcement work elsewhere in the world or in their lives and they associate that with planning in the absence of any other knowledge and understanding equally understandably i think the more i think tony is spot on i think community engagement is critical and potentially is viable even with limited resources um, but i i think how how members are engaged with as well is really important um, i did have some very good news stories in some of the work that i've done with regards to the power of having members on side um, and, and how important that can be right through to actually the resources that they're given. If they're seen as doing something that's helpful, either organisationally or even I'd go as far as to say to the individual, then it impacts upon decisions that are made and, and how the positioning of the, of the organisation uh, is, is sat. Um, so I think I think it is part of the problem, and I think along with the community space that Tony mentioned, I think it's an area to prioritise, and again, one that doesn't necessarily involve a significant amount of resource. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the word resource, I think, uh, you know, echoes loudly around this. Uh, we've had two further comments in uh, from Alison Pilkington and Tracy Horner, uh, both of whom are basically reflecting on the discussion. So I, I won't bring them in now because uh, we are out of time uh, but it does uh, I think reflect that need to prioritize to prioritize where the resources go um, and I think what it actually demonstrates is that your presentations and the discussion we've had uh, is provoking thought there uh, amongst the audience and uh, that's a great start to the enforcement week so Tony and Adam thank you very much for your your presentations and your input uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed it and uh, there is lots more to come. So follow the programme and uh, let's all look forward to a really uh, fascinating week ahead as we share knowledge and experience. Thank you, everybody.